Hello, and welcome to Peak Prosperity's Featured Voices podcast. I'm your host, Adam Taggart. Here at Peak Prosperity, we strive to surface models of better ways for entering the future. How can we be more sustainable and resilient, both environmentally and economically? Well, this week, we're going to look at the fashion industry. We've all heard of the human rights violations that unethical sweatshop operators can be guilty of. But did you know that it's, the fashion industry is responsible for 5% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions? That's equivalent to the impact of the aviation industry, of all the planes flying around the planet each year. Just as what we eat impacts not only our health, but the welfare of those along the entire supply chain of food production and distribution, the same is true for what we wear. Now, we have at least some standards, like organic labels, that help us choose which type of farming models we want to support. But what about our clothes? How can we tell if the shirt we're buying is made from sustainably grown materials, or colored from non-toxic dyes, or whether the weaver who made it was paid a living wage? To help us understand and navigate how our clothing choices impact the world around us are Scott Leonard and Matt Reynolds, the co-founders of Indigenous Designs, one of the world's leading fair trade fashion companies. Matt and Scott have been passionate agitators for greater social responsibility throughout the entire supply chain in the fashion industry. And they've created a successful model at Indigenous to help lead that change. Scott and Matt, thanks for taking the time to speak with us today. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. Really nice to be here. Well, let's start with some background on the dark side of the clothing clothing industry, because I think most people are completely unaware of it. Just how bad is the situation when it comes to pollution, human rights violations, and the like? Well... Um, you addressed it right there in the beginning. I mean, it is a it is a nasty industry, um, and we actually founded Indigenous to really address that problem. Um, fashion is the third largest contributor to global pollution, um, as you had mentioned, uh, petroleum being right up there at the top. And another thing that people don't think about is how many people work in the fashion industry. Um, one in five people on the planet in some way touch the supply chain of the fashion industry or the retail side of the fashion industry or the cut and sew or the manufacturing side um, or even the farming agricultural side and over 80 percent of those people that are in the fashion industry are women um, and all too often they are exploited uh, and not treated with dignity or respect so it is a really really dirty industry and we are uh, here to be a bellwether example of a fashion brand that is authentically turning a dirty industry upside down. Some other little stats, um, 5% of every landfill is textiles. Nearly 100% of those textiles could be recycled, but they aren't. Mm -hmm. They're just discarded. Um, 22% of the insecticides used worldwide are sprayed on crops, and it takes a third of a pound of pesticides to just make one cotton t-shirt it's 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 pretty bad out there uh and we're well, really and, and you know what i'll say is i'll interject a little bit here to say that it's not all doom and gloom there are companies like indigenous and, that's right <laughs> and 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 uh we can support uh organic cotton we can uh we certainly can support things a lot of circular activity we talk about circular fashion different ways that we can take all that landfill that that you were talking about, Matt, Mm -hmm. and put it into use into a more than just a recycling mode. So literally building products from the beginning also that that are amazing from the molecule and being able to look at it from a from a circular standpoint. There's organizations out there like Fashion for Good, which we've been very instrumental in uh, being on the ground floor out of Amsterdam that is actually percolating a lot of the innovations around building better products. But there's a lot of things we can do, including uh, adhering to great fair trade principles, which we do with indigenous. I'm not sure if that's something that that, uh, we might want to talk a little bit about. Sure. Well, um, you just used a word there, fair trade, which um, I've heard a little bit about, largely in respect to, I think, products like coffee, um, but also a little bit in, in fashion. But um, just so folks listening have an understanding, what exactly is meant when we talk about fair trade? Yeah, if you look at the roots of fair trade, it's, it, it, it is commodity-based. And it was actually to ensure that the producers of our, say it's bananas, 
or coffee were actually pay, paid a fair price for their yield at the end of the year in the marketplace because what we were seeing was a lot of subsidies going on from governments and then all of a sudden, wow, wait a second, these this coffee that I've I, I've grown, I can barely get by with uh, with what's uh, the price on the market uh, as a farmer. So creating fair trade was like creating a fair floor price for the products in advance with the buyers. Okay. That's the premise of, of fair trade. Since then, and that was back in the 70s, since then um, there's been ways to incorporate almost all different aspects of supply chains into fair trades, but the, the root of it is around allowing workers and producers to have a voice and a negotiation and uh, a participatory way uh, of of moving forward in in the products that they produce. Got it. And and a way that I've I've sort of thought about it myself, which sounds like it still might be accurate given what you're saying, is it's that floor you're talking about. It's sort of ensuring that the the worker who is essential to bringing that commodity to market is is getting paid a living wage for it, so that we're not basically undermining you know, the, the, the base of the pyramid for commodity production. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and there, maybe there's a few things I can kind of bring to light that we call them our fair trade principles yeah. uh, that we adhere to at, at Indigenous. So um, it's all about maintaining these long-term relationships. So one thing you don't want to do as a brand is go in one year and offer a great price for, say, it's a garment in our case, or offer work and then pull back out. You want to be there for the long term. You don't want these what we call peaks and valleys that happen because that that doesn't give the community steady workflow uh, and a source for viable income, right? So uh, again, not coming in and 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 just offering in the case of commodities, coming in one year and being a buyer for coffee with uh, with indigenous, not just coming in one year and producing some garments and then leaving, having solutions for the long term. Um, aspect and accountability for for capacity building with with artisans is key great it, you know before you move on from yeah. there it, it, as, as i've understood it um which you know i i think is is uh both very respectable but also just makes a lot of long-term uh, business sense um is is by making long-term commitments you know the point you made earlier is you're allowing the community to invest in itself Right to invest oh, yeah. in infrastructure, absolutely. Uh, to invest in, you know, if you're dealing, especially in in some of these more developing markets, right, where um, uh, you might be dealing with people that otherwise might be itinerant, right. You give them the opportunity to to plant roots, uh, to put in sanitation, to invest in education, to invest in hospitals, things like that that they otherwise might not be able to if they're having to uproot to go to the next, you know, commodity or the next area where someone's paying the best price that year for whatever product that is, right? Mm -hmm. So so rather than, you know, uh, uh, persisting this problem where people are, are perpetually migrant, you're actually giving them the opportunity uh, to invest, uh, to to build stability themselves. And, and for you as the business partner, you don't have to go find new sources of labor every year. You know that you've got this, you know, long-term dependable and eventually you know, fairly highly trained community over time. Is that is that an accurate way to think? Oh, about it? it is very accurate. Okay, it's absolutely. actually when you look at the the when we when we when we started this this company, one of the ideas was to support exactly that. How can we have indigenous women more empowered to actually own um, a, a a viable business and income stream that allowed them to reinvest money into the family, into education, into... Um, Preserve the cultural traditions of their handicraft. But um, How to make... We make de democratic decision-making processes as well, which is a huge part of fair trade. So they actually have a voice in the actual process and in the, in the, in the pricing and the product um, um, value proposition. We found that when you're, when you're investing back into women, it actually does go back into education with kids and meal planning into the family unit. So that's literally one of the things that we've done. And, and yeah, it does actually create a stronger sense of stability. Um, and we've, that's one of the things that we've, we've actually brought to the table too, is, is bringing not only the education, but the training 
to the table so that they can actually do exactly that. Great. And, and um, uh, we'll get specifically into the indigenous model in just a moment, but um, uh, because you mentioned it briefly, uh, you, you said you worked with indigenous women and, and there it's small I indigenous, meaning you're actually talking about uh, people who live in a particular part of the world. I think with indigenous, yeah. you're, you, you're dealing with artisans in Peru, correct? That's correct. Uh, okay. Throughout South America, uh, we don't only work in Peru, but we have a very large part of our um, uh, production partners that are in Peru and the artisans that we actually support and the indigenous uh, working groups that we that we actually have been working with for over a decade now are in Peru. Okay, so but we're talking about you know developing market um, people that uh, historically you know quite low wage earners. Oh yeah. Uh, before models like yours, you know, at, at, at the, the vagaries of, of, you know, whatever's available in that market to make a, to, to make a dollar. Uh, and maybe in the past it was working for a, a sweatshop or, or some operator like that where they, they didn't have a voice. They weren't necessarily paid a living wage. Maybe the revenue was there one, the income was there one year, but it wasn't there the next year if, if you know, the employer moved on to somebody else. Um, that's an accurate, that yeah, that's yeah. an accurate way of looking at it too. And we, we've gone to very hard to reach places as well where there's no income at all. And it, it kind of goes back to what you were talking about as far as that migrant worker, giving them an opportunity to stay in the communities in which they'd like to, but there's sometimes not a, a viable income, income stream or work that they can actually grab hold of. So we've gone to these out of our way to go to these really hard to reach places to to support the communities and it's not just been about the work for us we've gone beyond fair trade too so some of those educational programs that you're saying uh, when you invest into community and allowing the women to invest in the community well we've actually enhanced that by uh, by surrounding them with NGO support and coming in and bringing in things like clean water initiatives that we've paid for ourselves so like, for instance, last year, uh, we, we paid for 250 artisan families to have clean drinking water in a very hard to reach places, um, 10,000 feet and above. Uh, and we're going to continue on with these, these types of programs. But it's, it's being able to support that overall community that is so important that you've spoken to Adam and that Matt and I are both so um, passionate about continuing forward with indigenous as a model. All right, and so this, this, I mean, this is definitely a form of social responsible, socially responsible business, which I think we'll talk about a little bit more because you guys are definitely one of the more um, active companies that I know of in the whole social responsibility, uh, social responsibility space. Um, but, uh, you know, looking at the business side of things, um, you guys have been in business, uh, you know, with this model for 20 years ish or so, right? Yeah. Um, uh, obviously, uh, it, it's great for a number of humanitarian reasons uh, to do some of the things that you just mentioned there, Scott, right? Like bringing clean drinking water into these, these uh, communities and whatnot. Um, because you've been at it now for so long, um, can you can you speak to some of the the long-term benefits just on the bottom line side that you've gotten from being socially responsible? Well, I don't, I think that, I don't know, I'm feeling it, it might be helpful to give everybody a sense of kind of where we started um, first before sure. addressing that question. So um, both Scott and I have a deep passion um, for sustainability um, and also uh, indigenous culture and knowledge um, and grew up with that respect. Um, you know, myself, I had a chance to live through Central and South America early on and I uh, saw firsthand that we live in a really diverse world uh, and that um, there were so many people that didn't have the opportunities that I had growing up. And so we said we went to go climb, when we started Indigenous, we said we went to go climb a mountain because we literally were in the Andes um, meeting with artisans. Um, but we say it's not wasn't a mountain of earth, really, that we were trying to climb. climb. We were trying to create a scalable, um, viable model, a cottage industry model that respected the deep cultural traditions of the Andean people and wouldn't harm our environment at the same time. And how do we meet people that are amazing, 
passionate entrepreneurs that don't have opportunities. And not to be a charity, but to really be, uh, uh, to give a leg up or to give a, a helping hand and bringing them access to financing, helping them with design, helping bring their skills to the main stage to be the best product out there in the world, um, but made in a way that is truly authentic and um, respecting the actual hands that made it and the person that is involved with it and also using materials that don't harm our environment. So that's where we started. And um, with great fit and style, I might add. Well, exactly. <laughs> well, that, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, exactly. Um, so, you know, here we are, flash forward 20 years uh, later um, as a, you know, a, a multi million dollar fashion brand um, that is in Nordstrom's, Barney's, Bloomingdale's, Saks, and hundreds of specialty retailers um, that is 100% stayed committed to those founding values. And I think that's a really important thing to, to point out that everything we do, it's not just a, a niche of our brand mm -hmm. that is fair trade and organic. It's 100% social and environmental commitment. And that is, I think, what is very unique about Indigenous. Um, so full circle back to you know the artisan. They're, they're entrepreneurs. So we've created this virtual entrepreneurial engine that is working with artisans dispersed um, in very remote, impoverished regions uh, in, around the developing world um, and um, are helping them create these micro enterprises um, and little communities where a knitter or a weaver might be given a zero interest, interest loan by, by us and our, uh, our partners and they're able to then get their own looms and bring it in and, and start bringing in their friends to work on looming. And eventually that expands. And before you know it, you've got 50, 60 um, artisans all producing together, making a fair living wage mm -hmm. that's third party certified. So everything um, that we do, whether it's organic certification, has to be third party certified um, to ensure the authenticity. If it's fair trade, it has to be third party certified to ensure the actual artisans are making a living wage. Great. So um, thank you for giving that backstory. And it, it, it did a great job of, of really putting its finger on what I find most inspiring about you guys, right? Which is that you, and this sort of goes to the question I asked earlier, which maybe I'll ask in a slightly different way, but um, you have been able to be true to those ideals um, and to be sort of, you know, at the vanguard of, of social responsibility. Um, but to your point, you know, it, it's not to simply be a charity. In other words, you guys could be a nonprofit yeah. bringing, you know, clean drinking water yeah. or, or economic opportunity or, or low cost loans to these people. But you've actually built this into your business model. And you, know, you mentioned that you're a multi million dollar fashion company now after two decades uh, and you're running profitably. I take it. No, yes. I'm seeing no, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you, you've actually figured out how to do what I think a lot of entrepreneurs you know, even here in the States would love to do at heart, but not necessarily have figured out how to do in practice, which is to remain committed 100%, as you said, you know, to the, the founding ideals, but to be able to do so at a profit. You really, truly appear to be doing well by doing good. The triple bottom line, right? Yeah. People, yeah. planet, and profit. Yeah. So, you know, kind of back to my original question, 20 years into doing this, um, by making these investments mm -hmm. um, into the communities in which you're you're engaging with, um, it sounds like you have actually seen an economic return on that over time, right? You've actually seen that you've gotten better quality products that you're able to sell at a higher price point and that it's, be created, it's creating a virtuous cycle over time. Correct? Right, right. Yeah. I mean, we've actually, um, we have taken though a very methodical and patient um, a, uh, pro progression a, a in the building. This. Story, yes, right? a 20 year yeah. overnight success story because it was, it's really disruptive. I mean, it truly, when we started out, um, was a first of its kind in terms of a distributed cottage industry production model that uh, had a, a long-term goal to redistribute wealth back to artisans at the base of the pyramid or in these economically marginalized communities. And that um, required a tremendous amount of commitment and passion. Um, to hold true. So our first decade was all bootstrapping and um, 
building the back end and we self invested um, our own capital um, in millions into the back end model to create a scalable cottage industry production model that could be reliable that could bring the quality that meets the needs of a customer that's used to shopping at Neiman Marcus or Nordstrom's um, and then also to do it though with the ethics that that we're talking about and not um, to go back to what Scott mentioned earlier, not go in and say, okay, we've got a big purchase order from Nordstrom's. We're going to do 10,000 units with this uh, knitting group and then see you later. Yeah. yeah. You know, they ramp up, they have to do it. And then the next year you're gone and they don't have any work well, and they've left their other jobs right. to do that. So we, we had to create long-term visibility, yeah. forecasting and uh, looking at capacity planning mm -hmm. to be able to successfully do this very methodically to maintain the profitability um, that we we knew we had to do as a business. Um, and I will say, just to say, we are one of the first 17 B corporations. I don't know if you've heard of what the yeah, B corporation is. I'm glad you mentioned that because I was literally just going to ask that question. Um, so, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know if everybody listening here knows exactly what a B company or B corporation is. So, B corporations take into consideration um, all stakeholders of a business, not just the shareholders. Um, so, it actually is for responsible businesses that are wanting to improve the livelihoods of. of the, uh, everybody that actually is involved in the product that the company is offering, as well as the employees of the company, as well as the shareholders. Um, so it is a benefit corporation, is what B Corporation stands for. And there are a number of states, it's passed, there are now over 2,000 B Corporations um, globally, and we're very proud to be the one of the first uh, 17 and signers on the um, what they call the B Corporation uh, Declaration of Interdependence. Okay. <laughs> so for I think for us it was uh, actually a legacy move um, when we when we joined as as a B Corp. It allowed us to actually galvanize our values and our principles literally into our bylaws. And mm. so you when you become a, a for benefit uh, corporation for people on planet, you're able to take the values that mean the most to you and bring them mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. and get your shareholders to sign off on that. So everybody's on the same page. So for instance, for us, legally, we actually have to adhere to those principles. And that means that no matter who is guiding this ship years in the future, we can we can count on those values to to stay true. So, for instance, only using organic cotton. That's what we do. We only have used certified, hundred percent certified organic cotton. When and that, we use and that, and that, when we use cotton, and that is meaning meaning we use a lot of different fibers, but we're not going to use conventional cotton. Right. So we have only only using one hundred percent certified organic cotton when we use cotton, as you said, Matt. And um, also adhering to fair trade principles, but also being a beacon for sustainability and collaboration. We actually have that as something in our bylaws. Can you imagine? Like we want to blow on the coals of right. sustainability with other companies and be a uh, a beacon in that way. So um, you guys did a great job explaining that. And as as I understand it, um, you know, as you said, Scott, you're you're really. Um, you're baking the social responsibility commitments into the bylaws of the company. Yeah. And you said something I just want to make sure folks understand, uh, if I understand it correctly, which is uh, if indigenous say were to get bought by another company, um, the indigenous division would still have to be run according to those commitments, right? Like that's, that's part exactly of what right. the B Corporation structure does, right? It, it makes those those values and those those commitments permanent. That's right. right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, fantastic. And just really quickly, if folks want to learn more about B Corporations, where would they go online? Do you know? So you can just Google B Corporation or B Lab. Okay. Um, is, and is B Lab the entity that sort of oversees yeah, exactly. and answers questions and helps B yeah. Corporations? Yes. Yeah. yeah, they do a lot of the due diligence and do the, all the certifications. And you go through quite a process to become uh, a B Corp. Um, and you mentioned now that there are thousands of them. Um, yeah, you, you over 2,000. One of the very first few. Um, but I mean, so there, there are some big, well known brands in there, right? I mean, like. Absolutely. Patagonia. And what, what are some other big brands that are in there that folks might recognize? Ben and Jerry's. Ben and Jerry's. Okay. Um, Method. Okay, great. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's not just. 
a confederation of, of just small companies. No, it's our good small, friends at job. Guayaquil. We're here in Sebastopol, California. Our friends at Guayaquil also are, are one of the one of the original founding B Corps Members too. Of the B Corps. Yeah. And for those listening, Athleta just became oh, a Athleta. B Corp. Great. I mean, I live in a house with uh, teenage girls, and we have a lot of Athleta catalogs there. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, great. So I'm really glad that you brought the, the, the B Corp element into it. Um, so uh, real quick, um, I probably should have started with this, but, um, you know, indigenous, just very quickly, give us a sense of the type of products you guys make. So we, we focus on impeccable quality knits um, for women. Um, so sweaters, uh, uh, shirts, dresses, uh, skirts, um, cardigans, uh, tunics. Um, you can go to indigenous.com and see our, and selections, see yeah. our selections. Uh, we also have a, 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 a really tight curated men's offering, um, but we're, we're primarily driven by women's fashion, better end quality women knits that are having the handmade element to them. Um, or are completely handmade. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and for folks listening, um, and we'll, we'll talk in a moment about how you can learn more about indigenous and whatnot. Um, but uh, yeah, go to their website. You can we, we can talk about the quality of the design, but it's the kind of thing you just have to see for yourself, and you'll take a look at it. And it's meant to. It's meant to last. It is made so well um, that it will hold up over time. We design with. Uh, Western European detailing, so it's very, um, very classic in design and can transition from season to season. Um, we joke it's investment dressing. You buy a piece of indigenous, um, you take care of it. It will take care of you. It will be in your closet for years and years to come. This is not fash fashion. This right. is slow fashion. <laughs> <laughs> well, and one thing I want to underscore too, and, and and look, my wife will tell you I'm the last guy to talk to you about fashion in terms of how I dress myself. But, um, you know, when I think of, uh, uh, you know, knits that are made by, you know, people in the developing world, I kind of picture sort of the, the bulky, fuzzy alpaca sweaters that you see at your like, you know, local farmer's market or swap meet or something yeah. like that. Um, I mean, looking at the, the garments that you guys have in, in, in folks where I'm, I'm recording this in the actual uh, offices of, of indigenous. Um, I mean, this looks just like walking into a Nordstrom's or an into, I mean, these are, these are, you know, everyday high quality fashion garments that you just see on, you know, professionals yeah, walking down I, I, Madison Avenue. I mean, it's, I would, I would say that they're impeccably handcrafted in that, in that way. And we're able to get uh, things that are knit um, on these lo on looms um, that are hand loomed that you can get this really thin knit feel for it. So although we do a lot of hand knits as well, we're able to get things in what they say like thinner gauge. So you can have you can have knit quality items that that really are for any occasion. It can be casual, it could be lightweight. Uh, and that's the market that we've actually addressed. So when Matt kind of went through all the different products that we offer, we're able to get handcrafted detail um, and impeccably and, and made, in, right? Yeah, and we use only the finest raw materials. So if it's cotton that's grown organically, we're using Pima cotton, which is the one of the highest quality, softest cottons out there. Um, it just happens to be grown without pesticides, chemicals, or defoliants. Right. And then if we use... Um, Alpaca, our alpaca is free range and we're using only the finest uh, fibers on the alpaca, which we call royal um, alpaca or uh, baby alpaca, which is the underbelly of the alpaca, which is the softest portion of the, of the, um, of the fleece. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's exquisitely soft. Uh, we're able to uh, produce things that are really sheer and thin. Two, we can absolutely, we have some beautiful, big, thick, rich, warm, um, hand-knit, chunky, 100% free-range alpaca sweaters that people love. Mm -hmm. But they're not what you would imagine at the market square when you're traveling uh, through the Andes. Yeah, yeah. And, and, <laughs> yeah uh, all I wanted to, and I think you guys did a great job of describing the, the quality yeah. one. I, I just wanted to sort of dispel anyone thinking that, oh, this, you know. 
this looks like I'm wearing kind of a third world garments and I'm going to stand out. It's like, <laughs> and no, Scott these, and Matt yeah. are in their serapes right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but real, real quick, cause yeah. the, I really like that Matt described it. Um, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, I made some comparisons to food production. Um, but you know, uh, just as somebody would subscribe to us to a CSA, um, and I've, we've interviewed, um, some CSA providers, uh, on the program in the past, um, where they know they're getting better quality food, either produce or meats, um, that's been produced in a sustainable way that's environmentally friendly, that is um, better for our bodies and better for the soil and the animals involved, right? It's that yeah. triple win, right? You guys basically created a model that's very similar, uh, you know, just around around clothing, right? Which is, um, you know, we're, we're, we're getting the highest quality output to be able to make the best garments in a way that treats everybody in the ecosystem the best and you know the people who are wearing it feel like they're wearing the highest quality product around so i really like what you've been able to do there um you know as people are going to make their their next clothing purchase decisions mm -hmm. um you know in in the in the markets it's getting easier it's still not exactly easy mm -hmm. but it's getting easier to make more informed food choices right that the labeling is getting better the standardization is getting better most groceries have you know clearly marked organic sections versus not and whatnot such a I, I don't great. know. Is it that way in the in, in the fashion world? I, I don't think it is. But if if, if you're, uh, you know, uh, are there standards that are evolving? Are there ways yes. for people to make a more informed choice if they're pulling a shirt off the rack? Can they say, how do I know? Is there a way for me to know that this shirt was actually produced in a fair trade way? So that is such a fun question for us to answer um, because, you know, we've actually been so passionate about the conversation of transparency. Um, for for so long and, and in fact um, I don't know if you or your listeners uh, remember the horrific tragedy that happened um, in Rana Plaza where over 2,000 factory workers were killed when a factory collapsed and structural damage was determined in the building prior to the collapse but workers were forced to go back because uh, fear of losing their jobs. Yeah, this was and in Southeast the, Asia. Right? Yeah, and yeah. and uh, in the, and before that, we created something called the Fair Trace Tool back in 2011, where every one of our garments had a hang tag that you could scan with a QR code, and you could meet the artisan that made your product, learn about the social impact of your purchase, and see where it was made. And even more remarkably, on the back end we used SMS technology or cell phone mm -hmm. to be able to communicate directly and anon anonymously and confidentially with the actual artisan to ask them, are you working in a safe place? Are you better off than you were six months ago? And we used economic indicator questions um, that we worked with World Bank um, about, you know, do you own a refrigerator, which told us whether they were doing meal planning, if they had electricity, if they were able to transport big ticket items. Mm -hmm. And all of that came back in. That's we called able, the out of, just for listeners, that's called the out of poverty index from Grameen Bank. Hey, thank you, thank you. Um, so we were able to take that information and assess the, the economic well-being of our actual supply chain. And when we saw a, a hole or something that didn't look quite right, mm -hmm. we were able to go in and address it and, and, and make it right as the brand. So if that tool was available to, to the brands that were working in that Rana Plaza factory, uh, you know, we'd like to think that that tragedy could have could been have prevented been if, they, if these were responsible brands. So we're ecstatic right now because we're working on the Fair Trace Tool 2.0. <laughs> okay. um, and it is um, engaging even more deeply um, the relationship between the artisan and the consumer. Um, and in fact, um, if we succeed, this tool will actually um, have the ability for you as the customer, if you say you bought an indigenous garment and you loved it, that you could tip the artisan directly oh, on wow. your own. Um, and it will be one of the first blockchain levels of transparency for demonstrating that deeper authenticity and credibility of supply chain at every step. So that's actually um, a great segue because what we're doing right now um, is we're swiveling this traditional wholesale private label company that we've had for the last two decades, and we're 
um, swiveling to an omni-channel approach, really all about working directly and with the consumer and having a direct online presence. So you can go to indigenous.com um, and see Indigenous personally, and that allows us to share our story with you intimately, and you're able to get it direct from um, the horse's mouth, so to speak, as to what we're doing, as opposed to maybe um, through other channels. Well, being able to control the narrative and bring that story directly to the consumer, right? And, and the fair trace tool is just one of those ways to do it, but we believe that um, every garment tells a story of artisan and impact, and the consumer is actually looking for that authentic brand, and that's exactly what we deliver. Um, and that we believe that the, the care for our garments starts long before they're ever taken home and worn. And we want to bring each of those touch points of that care directly to the consumer. And the fair trace tool is a way to do that, mm -hmm. to really actually draw, be able to show all the different positive uh, aspects of impact from the farmer, from the organic farmer, all the way to the artisan even to the actual packaging that we're using that's all around those sustainability um, areas that we care so much about. Wow. Yeah. And we want to and we want to share that we want to share it. When we come up with it, we don't want to hold it proprietary as just an indigenous thing. We actually want everybody to be able to use this tool. So, yeah, I just find this so incredibly interesting because um, it makes total sense how it addresses a lot of the uh, the core issues that you talked about earlier that you know the, the dark side of the fashion industry and shines a bright light on them in ways that brands like you can you know can force behavior changes right you know you yeah. either you either tell these these uh, producers that aren't getting the scores you want to either you know make reforms or you're going to switch to somebody you know who will meet the the requirements um, I, I'm so glad you said it was on the blockchain because as you were describing it I was thinking the blockchain is is like exactly the kind of technology that would that would you know uh, enable something like this to work at, at this extremely trackable level. And our audience is very familiar with, with blockchain technology. We've talked a lot about it in the past. Um, and uh, again, so glad to hear that it's sort of an open source solution that you're saying, you know, you're, you're looking not just to use it for your company, but to, to transform the industry. So the big question I have uh, for you, because I, I got so excited hearing your description of all this is like, I think this could scale to any consumer product, right? I mean, That's this, right. this could track the, the 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 beef at your table from calf to how it was raised, right? Was it was it grass fed? Was it was it you know pastured or was it you know bounced around to a whole bunch of different uh, feedlots or whatever? Like you you could know, right? Um, your consumer electronics, you know, was was Absolutely. this smartphone you know built in a in a in a you know a horrible sweatshop by somebody who's working twenty hours a day and not seeing you know the sun uh, or getting paid a wage or, or or is the artisan actually being well taken care of yeah, you know, yeah. in this part so it, Com is that true I mean could it literally be used by almost any consumer product absolutely in fact when we created the fair trace tool 1.0 um, it was adopted by um, some food companies uh, we shared that um, and Lotus Lotus. Uh, Foods, for example, used our fair trace tool to help share about their their uh, rice farmers and and everything that they were doing and, and bringing transparency to their supply chain. So we are a uh, hundred percent um, in in full favor of all industries using this because you know we should know who made our product. We should know uh, if, if that we're making an informed choice when we make our purchases. The fair trace tool is truly something that we're proud of bringing forth to let you know lift all boats, all industries, and that's part of our commitment as a as a company uh, that's literally embedded our very DNA embedded into sustainability. Oh, I, I just think that's a great great technology. Um, all right, so we got to wrap up here. Um, this has been a great conversation, guys. Um, a couple of things I want to get into as we begin to close. Um, first. Matt, you mentioned earlier that um, uh, you used the word omnichannel, which I'm going to guess most people don't really quite get what omnichannel means. But I think the core of what you were saying is, is sort of historically, um, indigenous as a as a brand has been uh, a wholesaler, a white labeler for other yes. bigger labels that have sold in some of these stores you've talked about. 
But now it sounds like you guys are beginning to increasingly go direct to consumer, that you're letting people buy directly from you. Is that accurate? Exactly. So our you know, two decade experience working with other retailers and other brands producing, i.e. white label for other brands or um, wholesaling to other retailers that you would go into and buy is translating really, really nicely into a direct to consumer um, opportunity and the we started doing that this year and we opened our first retail store in uh, here in Sonoma County on Earth Day um, and it's been doing great and then we also um, really relaunched our own direct to consumer site um, and the the results are been outstanding. I would encourage people to actually go to our website. Well, I was going to say so question I always ask is how can people learn more? So it's indigenous.com, indigenousdesigns.com? How Indi- would they find it? Indigenous.com, I-N-D-I-G-E-N-O-U-S.com. Um, and you can learn all about it. Um, we have an incredible program called a loyalty program where you get these care coins that you can apply. And, and then when we get this fair trace tool 2.0, um, our idea is to tie in those care coins that we reward you with as you shop indigenous so that you could even be per- sharing those with the artisans. That's coming uh, hopefully soon. Um, we'll be able to give that. But yeah, check out the loyalty program too. Okay, great. So obviously those folks listening, um, if you are interested in learning more, want to see what their designs look like, perhaps become a customer, um, check out the fair trace tool, whatever, indigenous. Dot com. Um, one of the things I, I love about companies like yours is, um, uh, you know, I, I used to be involved in a, a meat CSA and gave this talk a lot to people that would come onto the farm and learn about how we, we uh, raise the, the animals there. Um, is, uh, you know, everybody would like to see animals raised more humanely. Everybody would like to eat higher quality meats. Um, not everybody really realizes the individual agency we all have to advance those models, and it's by voting with our dollars, right? It's, right. it's literally by supporting the models that uh, we believe in with our dollars makes those models more economically viable, right? It, you know, organic food will probably always cost more than conventional food, but if more and more people buy organic, those dollars get reinvested in the system, allow that system to grow to economies of scale, and that delta between the good and the bad begins to shrink, yep. right? And it becomes easier and easier for more people to make that decision. And you guys are basically at the vanguard of doing that around clothing, fashion, which I think is wonderful. Um, all right, so in closing, um, you guys have mentioned to me that um, uh, you're a 20-year overnight success story, <laughs> um, and now you're investing in the, the next stage of your growth, and you guys... Now you just were talking there about the, uh, the, the whole direct consumer uh, channel that you guys are building here. Um, it sounds like you guys are, um, uh, I guess, have a, you, you, you're in a funding round and there's still some potential for uh, investors uh, who are interested to potentially participate. So, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Very quickly, I just want to give you a chance to let yeah. anybody who's interested here um, know about what you're up to. Sure. So the success that we've been talking about online um, has actually already been funded by what is a series B that we're going through right now. And we are, uh, we still do have some opportunities for investors to participate. Uh, I won't go into great detail here uh, right now, but would really welcome any folks that uh, think that this is something that they would want to support. There's a nice strong uh, return on the investment that we have um, planned out and would love to talk more about that growth with anyone that, that uh, wants to, uh, entertain the conversation Great. And, and i'm just curious is there uh is there sort of an ideal investor that you'd be looking for either in terms of uh do they have to be an accredited investor or are you looking for somebody who's sort of very philosophically aligned or what would what, what you kind of what, what would be the right type of person to knock on your door here so we we have a great group of investors in our series a um, round um, that are what we call um, impact investors, mm-hmm. very values align- aligned, um, mission uh, related. Which obviously, if you're, if you're a Peak Prosperity member, you're you're most likely very going to be values aligned with what we're doing. Um, our investors are accredited, um, so yes, this is an accredited uh, investor round, and um, uh, you know, you would. Be joining a very, very wonderful family of of uh, 
values aligned impact investors. Um, that would that's what we're looking for, or strategic investors as well. Anybody that is in, that has experience in the digital space and scaling uh, direct to consumer online channels would be uh, tremendous. Even just to to reach out with advice. Great, great, um, awesome. So for folks who want to learn more about the the Series B. Um, whom should they contact? Yeah, they can Scott. contact uh, me, Scott, at indigenous.com okay. and be happy to give any information about this. Great. Um, well, guys, thank you so much. Uh, you guys are up to amazing things. Um, I'm sure that uh, we're going to get a lot of questions uh, from the listeners about uh, the model in general, um, probably some additional questions about the fashion industry, et cetera. Uh, hopefully we can pass them along your guys' way to help That'd answer some of this. That'd be great. We'd love that. Thank you so much. No, you're welcome, guys. Um, all right, everyone. Well, guys, um, look forward to talking to you guys again in, uh, I don't know, a year or two and see how things have gone between now and then. That would be fantastic. Thank all you, right. Adam. Thanks, guys.